Hey, Walter Sorrels back with another Knife Makers Friday Five. Today, how to choose sword steel. So quick note, I'm putting out my 2020 viewer knives video early next month, that's uh, January of 2021. So if you'd like to show off your work, send a, uh, an email with a photo or maybe a couple of photos of your knives to me uh, at the email address in the description. Okay, so moving on to the business at hand. Now one of my uh, Patreon supporters, Al DePaolo, recently wrote to me asking for recommendations about sword steels how to choose steels for making swords. So that's going to be the subject of our video here today. So first point is this. If you came here thinking I was going to go, here's the best sword steel, bye, uh, you're watching the wrong video. There is no best sword steel. You know, is a Ferrari better than a Ford pickup truck? It depends. If you're trying to carry home a bunch of 4x8 plywood from Home Depot, that Ferrari's not going to be much good for you. Um, so different swords have different requirements and what I'm going to try and do here today is talk about the thought process that you need to go through when you're figuring out what steel to use for the sword that you're making. So let me make one point just to get it on the table. All sword steels are going to be some kind of carbon steel or alloys that are pretty close to carbon steel, not stainless steel. If you want to make a sword out of stainless steel, by and large you're just really barking up the wrong tree. Stainless steels are typically more brittle than carbon steels. Now there's a lot of nuance to that, that, but that's the basic reality. So 10 series steels like 1080 as well as alloyed steels like 5160 or 80 CRV2, plus some other steels like 01, W1, W2, 52100. This is the general family of steels that we're talking about here, but we'll uh, delve into the specifics a little bit later. So the first question to ask is, in the particular style of sword that you're making, is springiness important? If it is, that leads you down one road. If edge holding is your most important consideration, that's going to lead you down a different road. Finally, and this is related to those questions, what are the parameters uh, that your particular historical tradition or the particular kind of sword that you're working on uh, what does that sort of lay out for you? So let's bite these off one at a time. But before we do, a really, really crucial point about all cutting tools. The single most important factor in the quality of an edge tool is heat treating, not steel. Heat treating. I'll say that again in case you missed it. The single most important factor in the quality of an edge tool is heat treating. When I say quality, I don't mean just good quality, bad quality. I mean in the sense that you'd say, what are the qualities that distinguish a pickup truck from a Ferrari? Now this is not the place to get into an in-depth explanation of heat treating, but basically the point is that by a combination of heating and cooling, you can induce steel to be harder or softer, springier or more brittle, all kinds of other things. Swords differ from knives in one really important way. Obviously they're longer, but by nature they're intended to be used in ways that involve very high impact and therefore high stress on the blade. Different sword making traditions have handled this by heat treating blades in different ways. So we can kind of broadly divide this discussion into two different categories, Japanese swords and everything else. Why is that? Well, the dividing line here is basically between swords that were hardened all the way through, that's Western swords, Chinese swords, Middle Eastern swords, Indian swords, and all that, uh, and so-called differentially hardened blades, and that's mostly represented by Japanese blades some exceptions to all this but that broadly is where it divides let's start with western style swords if you look at medieval swords they were reasonably broad reasonably thin and fairly heavily tapered so this means that they're pretty robust when you're cutting on the edge but they also needed to be relatively flexible um, because if they're hit on the side they're going to flex a good bit. So if you're trying to make a modern duplicate, you want steel that's reasonably flexible, that won't crack if bent side to side or wielded edge on, but that's maybe not going to have super high edge holding qualities because edge holding leads to brittleness. So a good starting point would be right here, 
1080 steel. This is a high carbon steel, keeps a pretty good edge, fairly simple to heat treat, and doesn't have some of the tricky issues that higher carbon steels like 1095, W1, W2, O1, and some others along those lines might have. As a fallback, you might also try 1050. Due to its lower carbon content, 1050 will have somewhat higher potential for shock resistance and somewhat lower edge hardness. Now, there are steels that have higher impact resistance. If you're looking to make a sword for historical type sparring, it's really important that they don't break. So the most important thing is springiness and flexibility because the opposite of springiness is breakiness, and that's really uncool. 5160 is a medium carbon spring steel that contains a little bit of chromium and fairly high manganese content. It's very tough, but it doesn't hold an edge all that well. A somewhat comparable steel is this right here, 80 CRV2, which has some nickel, which improves toughness, but maybe more importantly, it has higher carbon than 5160, as well as some vanadium, both of which together improve edge holding versus 5160. It's a little hard to find exact equivalences for measures of toughness on the data sheets that I've found, but my guess is that it's probably a little bit less tough than 5160, but no question it's going to hold an edge better. After that, you get into what are known as hyper-eutectoid steels, steels with carbon contents above roughly 0.8%. This would include 01, 1095, 52100, W1, W2. These are great steels, but I really don't view them as beginner steels for sword making, so I disregard them until you get a bit more experience and knowledge of metallurgy. So let me turn now to Japanese swords, which is kind of my specialty. The key point here is that Japanese style swords are differentially hardened, meaning that they're hard on the edge and then they're soft on the spine. Now, some people think that this means that they're springy. Absolutely not. If you jack the hell out of a Japanese sword, it's going to bend, and then it's going to take a set, and it's just going to sit there. So what that means is that if you want to use it again, you got to bend it straight to make it usable. That's just the reality of Japanese swords, but it's what also makes them really resilient and uh, less likely to break under impact. So how do you accomplish this differential hardening? by using a process which probably most of you have heard of called clay hardening. Clay is applied to the spine of the sword and then the blades quenched, hardening the edge where the blade cools rapidly but not where the clay retards cooling of the sword to such an extent that it doesn't harden. This creates a feature known as a hamon, which is basically a line that appears at that transition from hard steel to soft steel. In this case, simple carbon steels are ideal. Elevated levels of alloying elements like magnesium, chromium, and nickel change the heat treating characteristics of steel dramatically, and that really screws up your ability to produce a differentially hardened blade. All kinds of caveats there, but for this reason, I'd recommend 1080 as an ideal starter steel for swords, with 1050 being a reasonable backup. 10 series steels consist of nothing but iron, carbon, and a very small amount of manganese. Just a cautionary note, some 10 series steels have more manganese than others. Other steels like 5160 and 01 contain significantly more manganese, making them not particularly suited for differentially hardened blades. That's commonly true of 1084 and sometimes 1060. So when you buy steel, the supplier will typically give you a chemistry sheet for that particular lot of steel if you ask for it. So always ask for it. This is really important because if the manganese level starts creeping up to around 0.4%, differential hardening becomes problematic. It gets harder and harder to control it as that number goes up. So ideally you want to be in the 0.25 to 0.3 range. So to summarize, if I were just starting out making a U European sword for practical use, I'd probably start with 5160 or 80 CRV2, tempering them at 600 Fahrenheit uh, to start with, and that's gonna make them tough and springy, but at some sacrifice for edge holding. Now with Japanese swords, I'd start with 1080 or 1050 and temper it around 400 Fahrenheit and that's going to give you good edge holding. 
In all these cases, as you gain skill and knowledge and as you start to narrow down exactly what kind of swords that you're interested in and what characteristics you're kind of optimizing for, you're going to start making different choices, maybe different heat treating regimes, different uh, steels, but these are good places to start. And just as a quick aside, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into Japanese sword making, check out my Japanese sword videos at waltersorrelsblades.com and click on the videos tab. All right, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Unfortunately, as with all things metallurgical, we could dig into the specifics of these steels performance for 24 hours and we would still have tons and tons to say. At a certain point, this is my view anyway, you got to stop talking, jump in there, choose a steel, and then learn through trial and error. Unfortunately, you got to fail sometimes with this stuff. Figure out how to optimize for the qualities that you want. All right, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years. So I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. Walter Sorrels Blades dot com.